All right, ladies and gentlemen, introducing the Hertzberg Russell diagram according to stellar metamorphosis. All right, what we have on the left hand side of the graph, we have absolute magnitude and then we have the spectrum of the star. This would represent O, B, F, G, K, M, and L spectrum stars, all in their perspective positions on the diagram. Now, these all go cooler, dimmer, less luminous, less massive, and the absolute magnitude, this would be around 5, this would be say 0, this would be say negative 5, this would be 10, and this would be uh, 15. And basically the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram has the brightest stars up here, this general area, and then it has a slow curve all the way down here. And then that's it. And you have stars interspersed all along this graph. So basically, as the star cools, it also dims. It goes this direction. Now, this theory, clearly, I don't know if you can tell, but the last stage of this little diagram here stops right here, because you know why? They're too dim. The absolute magnitude goes to 20, 25, 30, 35. Now, what would be the absolute magnitude of a planet? You're looking at it. What they forgot was that this graph, it actually continues. It goes all the way down here. Now, down here, you have what are called planets. Planets. Or exoplanets. Now, the reason why they forgot these is because they don't have spectrums. They only called stars, the ones they could see, that were bright and they could see with telescopes, which were all of these, okay? And then they were like, oh well, if they're not bright, they're not shining, can't possibly be stars. They have to be planets or exoplanets because these are nuclear, oops, nuclear, that's stupid. Oh my goodness. N U C L E A R. And these are just random rocks, minerals, and inert gases. Okay? What they forgot, or what they messed up on, was that this was never nuclear. This was electrochemical. These are bright because of electrochemical reactions. Blues, you have your white, and you have your uh, yellow, and you go down to red, or not orange, comes before red, R-O-R-A-N-G-E, red, and then you have uh, what I would consider brown, and then you have your gray dwarfs, which are the gray area, gray area right here, and then you have your blue dwarfs, such as Neptune and Uranus. You go and you have your ocean worlds and your rocky worlds after the oceans dissipate from the ionizing radiation of a host star. Now, what I want to get across to my readers is that the reason why they had separated these from these is because they didn't realize the star is electrochemical 
it is not nuclear. Nuclear was invented with the protoplanetary disk model because they had to have the sun the same age as the Earth. So they needed a way to power the sun to keep it the same age as the Earth. But the sun is up here. It's a very young star, maybe 65 million years old at the most. So what happens is that if you keep these stars as, as old as these stars, what the astronomers are basically doing is saying, hey, to hell with all this. You know, to hell with all that. Planets are all over here. They're just random little rocks. Okay? That's what they messed up on. And I can tell, or you can tell, that I haven't really done a lot of these diagrams before because I can barely read my own handwriting. But as we progress through these videos, I'll make sure they're more legible. But this is the basic Hertzsprung Russell diagram. You have your magnitude and you have your spectrum. That's the Harvard classification spectrum. And you have this missing box where stellar metamorphosis comes into play. All right. Now, being that these young stars are electrochemical, that means the two main processes that stars experience are. Let's see here. Here is this. Chemical and electrical, which also encompasses magnetism. These three processes, these three, I guess, studies, not processes, are real star science. Real star science. Now you might say, oh well, hey, if that's, if that's how stars are powered, then where do we get all this matter from? Well, that's an easy question. Early 20th century scientists, they didn't realize that there's little objects called quasars in radio galaxies. Quasar is this really bright little object, okay? And what it does is it ejects matter in bilateral configurations. You can, take, you can see pictures of these things online. If you look it up, like Hercules A in radio, there will be these two large lobes that's going to look like this, kind of. I know, I suck at drawing. But all this material, this material, and whatever's happening in this little spot right here are the process of nuclear reactions. In other words, the velocities required to cause nuclear reactions exist inside of birthing galaxies. It has nothing to do with stars. Birthing galaxies. Those have the required velocities to fuse matter. These jets, they travel almost the speed of light, okay? I can guarantee you that is where fusion reactions are occurring. Not inside of the little balls of electrochemical reactions we call stars. No, right here. These are the most violent reactions in the entire universe. You study how a galaxy is born, and you'll understand how shit fucking works. Okay, sorry for cussing. Alright, I think that should sum it up.